whether you know it or not, whether you've thought about it this week or not, whether you've thought about it this morning or not, we are all in a battle. You have an enemy. Well, really, he's God's enemy. He, he really doesn't care so much about hurting you or hurting me, but he will ruthlessly and relentlessly fight against anything that lifts up God's glory. And if you plant your flag in your life that what your life is going to be about is lifting up God as worthy like we just sang, he wants to fight you. He wants to fight you in what you thought about and did this week. He wants to fight you in what you think about and do right now. Satan hates the glory of God. We think about that song, we say we just sang, and, and sure, we sang a song. You might not have thought about it, and I don't always think about it for sure, but you were fighting. You were fighting against Satan who wants to cloud your vision and, maybe even more importantly when we're together, the vision of all the people around you so that they won't think Jesus is worthy. So that when we sing, is he worthy of all of this, of all blessing and honor and glory, Satan wants you to at least say, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> or, Maybe to say, yes, I know the answer, he is. But he does not want you from your heart to say, he is truly worthy of absolutely everything. Sometimes we're more aware of the battle. You've been there. You've been on the weeks where it feels like the, the spiritual bullets are flying past your head. We've had those moments. Sometimes we're kind of clueless to the battle. We don't even realize we're in a battle. And that brings up its own picture of a very dangerous place to be. If you're walking across a battlefield and bullets are flying and you don't realize it, it's going to be a problem. But sometimes we're at a little bit different place and we're sitting on the edge of a battle. Maybe it doesn't feel like the bullets are flying right this moment, but you know it's coming. Tolkien recognized this. He put in the mouth of one of his hobbits this statement, I don't want to be in a battle, but waiting on the edge of one I can't escape is even worse. And Tolkien fought in World War I, so imagine you're bunkered down in a trench. Right now, the shells aren't flying. But you've got nowhere to go. Your gas mask is laying right there, and it's ready. You don't need it on right now. But you know, at any moment you could hear that cry and you would need to put it on and you would be in danger. If you're sitting in that trench, what do you need to know? What training do you need? Now let's put it in terms of spiritual warfare. And I want to give a couple examples. I trust that the Spirit of God will work through these examples, and maybe not even through these directly, but will bring up in your mind a situation like that, where you know there's spiritual battle coming, and it doesn't feel like the bullets are flying yet. Put yourself in that scenario. For example, maybe you know you've struggled with bitterness every time you interact with a certain family member, and it's December 10th, and Christmas is coming, and you're going to see them. There's spiritual warfare. That's coming. Really, it's kind of already there, but you're on the edge of what feels like the worst place. Or maybe you know a friend has been gossiping about you, and you know you're going to have a chance to talk with them, and you're going to bring it up. There is a spiritually difficult thing coming, and you're going to be tempted to have all kinds of wrong motives, and you're in the trench. The bullets aren't flying yet, but you're on the edge of a battle that you can't escape. Kids in this room, listen to me. You face spiritual warfare too. If you're a believer in Jesus, there are times when you know you're irritated and kind of angry about something, and you know your sibling or your parent's going to come tell you something. You think, I'm probably going to respond the wrong way. That's sitting on the edge of a spiritual battle. That works for adults too, by the way, not just kids. 
Maybe you're about to have some extra time off of work. You know there's going to be temptations to be lazy. And you know there's going to be temptations, instead of being lazy, to not rest like God wants you to rest. Do we often think vacation is potentially an upcoming spiritual battle? It is. Or maybe it's not you, but it's a friend who's sitting on the edge of something like that. And you think, I know there's something really difficult coming for them. What do you say to them? What do they need to hear? In John 14, that's exactly where Jesus and his disciples are. Jesus knows some of the darkest days his disciples will face are coming. Any conversation like that's going to be full of just emotion. It's going to be so charged with fear and desire and love and, and all kinds of emotions that are there. What is Jesus going to tell his close friends around the table? And we've looked at some of that. We're going to look at one section specifically beginning in verse 25 of John 14. Jesus looks across the table at his friends and he says, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Let's ask God for his help this morning. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this picture of a, an intimate, emotional conversation. Lord, we are like your disciples often. We sit on the edge of dark times that we don't understand. We have not understood all that you want us to understand in the past. And we need your grace and your comfort. Lord, we need the peace that only you can give, and I pray that you would work in our hearts through your word, that you would fulfill the promise that you give us, that your spirit would work today through this truth that you have given us in your word. He bring to our minds, to remembrance, all of the things that you have said. That he teach us what we need for the situations we're in right now. And we pray this in your name, for your glory. Amen. Jesus tells them, I'm going away, but I'm going to leave you two things that are absolutely invaluable. Verse 25, he says, I've spoken these things. If you look back in context, say, well, what things has Jesus just spoken to them? Most immediately, he's talked about, you're going to know something about me that the world is not going to know because you're going to have the Spirit, the Helper, the Paraclete, if we use that word, to help you to see and understand and love these truths. Jesus has talked about, you're going to have a special relationship with me that's different from other people. These things... I have spoken to you. But now he reminds them, yes, there's a special relationship, but that doesn't mean that I'm still going to be with you. That doesn't mean the road's going to be easy here because I am going away. That's what he says, while I am still with you. There's going to be a time not that long away when Jesus is not going to be with his disciples physically. These things I've spoken to you, while I am with you, I need you to remember Dark times are coming. He's just talked about a special relationship, and he doesn't want them just to say, oh, great, let's sit here and talk about our theological ideas and how we love God and all that and forget everything else. He says, no, remember, this is all in a context. I am about to leave you. But he leaves them two precious gifts. The first is verse 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit. First, notice 
when he talks about the spirit here, the spirit is not like the force from Star Wars. It's, it's a personal action here. He is going to teach. The Spirit is a person, the third person of the Trinity, who will come and will be with you. He will teach you. He is going to act. He's a helper. If you look back at verse 16, we saw this word last week. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. This helper, the Holy Spirit, is going to come, and he is going to act in Jesus' name. That's what verse 26 says. He's going to come lifting up Jesus' reputation. He's going to come doing what Jesus did and what Jesus is still doing in the world is is being accomplished through the Holy Spirit who will be left here. Jesus is saying, I'm going away, but you're not alone. And when we face dark times, that's one thing we need to know. Is Jesus here? Is God with me? Does he care? Jesus says, I am going away, and you are about to face something dark, but you have the Holy Spirit. And what's he going to do? He's a teacher. He continues in verse 26, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That makes sense. Earlier in the chapter, he called him the spirit of truth. So if he's the spirit of truth, he can then lead you into the truth. He can teach you the truth. Obviously, This promise doesn't mean that the disciples are going to learn everything about nuclear physics when it says he will teach you all things. It doesn't mean like all things in that sense. But Jesus is saying the Spirit is going to teach you everything that you need to know. First of all, everything that you need to know about what Jesus has told them. He's going to do it in part by bringing to remembrance all that Jesus has said. We see examples of this actually in the book of John. I'm sure John looked back at this promise and said, oh, That's what Jesus meant. Because if you go to chapter 2, which we won't turn there, Jesus says, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And everybody's around him. They're scratching their heads. They're saying, what do you mean? This temple took years to build. You can't build this temple in three days. There's no way. And John tells us in chapter 2, he says, they didn't understand it then. But later, looking back, they understood he meant it about his body. That's a fulfillment of what Jesus is saying right here. John is pointing back saying, oh, the Spirit has now shown us, here's what Jesus meant when he said that. He's fulfilling exactly what Jesus said when he said, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all I have said to you. He'll remind you of those words and teach you their significance. At this moment when Jesus talks through and says, I am going to the Father, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The disciples did not understand everything about that. They didn't get all of the implications. They didn't know how it was all going to work. But Jesus promises the Spirit will come and he will teach you those things. And in its most literal sense, let's not leave behind what's actually happening here. In its most literal sense, he's talking to the apostles and he's telling them, you have heard me actually physically speak words to you. Now think about it. They didn't have these things all written down. Let's imagine some of you who were here, say, 15 years ago, and John Stone preached. And somebody says, can you tell us what he preached 15 years ago? You're like, no. How long after Jesus went away, after he died and was raised, was the Gospel of John written? long time. A whole lot longer than you and I would remember exactly the words Jesus said. But Jesus promises, my spirit will help you to remember. We have confidence that we have the words of Jesus in part because of this promise that God's spirit would help the apostles sitting in that room remember, what did Jesus say? And so Jesus tells them, while they're sitting looking at the darkness on the edge of battle, if you will, They look at it. Jesus tells them, I'm going away, but that doesn't mean you're alone. I'm going away as the rabbi, as the teacher, but that doesn't mean you don't have a teacher. You have the Holy Spirit. Not only is he going to send the Spirit, though, he gives another gift, a related gift. Verse 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. 
Our world tells you to find peace all the time, don't they? Go find your own inner peace. What are the calls in our society for tolerating all the other viewpoints? Just live at peace with each other. Or in a more spiritual orientation, find the religion that helps you get peace with whatever's out there. Our world tells you over and over, peace, go find peace. Well, if you want real peace, it's not floating out there to be found. It is owned by Jesus. Notice his phrase. He says, my peace I give to you. Think about that. I could say, I hope you have peace. I can't tell you it's mine and I'll give it to you. Jesus doesn't even say, I hope you have peace, though. He says, this peace is mine to give, and I give it to my followers. Who have peace. It's his peace for lots of reasons, one of which it's his peace because he experienced it as a human, and we have examples of this. He had perfect peace with his father from eternity past. He had fellowship with his father. He had perfect peace with his father as he walked on this earth. He had such peace with other men that even when they attacked him, you say, that doesn't sound like peace. Okay, true. It doesn't mean there's no conflict, but well-being. He had such peace with other men that when they beat him and cursed him, he didn't say a word back to them. What peace does it take with other people to take the people who are crucifying you and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Not only that, but what does it take within yourself to do that? Or to be on a boat, rocking back and forth with the storm, and have such peace in yourself that you fall asleep. or to go all the way through death until you decide to lay down your life. What kind of, if you want to say inner peace, if you want to use that phrase, what kind of inner peace did Jesus have? And Jesus says, my peace, the peace I experienced on earth, my peace I leave and give to you. Our world chases after incomplete peace. It's always incomplete like, well, you have peace within yourself. All those other people, they'll attack you. You might have to fight them back every once in a while. You have fine peace within yourself. Might be nice if you could get it. Jesus promises something so much bigger. Peace with God, peace with others, peace within ourselves. That's what Jesus promises. And you look at other passages in the Scripture, we have this quoted in Romans. Therefore, having been justified, we have Peace with God. That truth is a fulfillment of what Jesus is telling his friends around the table right here. My peace I leave with you. That's part of it. We have peace with God. Ephesians 2, Jesus died so that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace with one another. 2 Thessalonians 3, may the God of peace can be called the God of peace. May the God of peace give you peace at all times and in every way. That only comes about through the forgiveness and restoration and cleansing that Jesus gives and the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus knows that his work is going to bring peace for his disciples with God, with each other, and inside of them. That's the peace when he says, it's my peace. It's not incomplete. It's my peace I am leaving with you. It's not built on carefully arranged circumstances. I'll ask you to take a minute and think, when the world says, here, find peace, what do they base peace on? Maybe it's health. My life's pretty good. I feel kind of healthy so I can have peace. Maybe it's power. 
I can influence and lead how I want to, so therefore I can have peace. I can control what the people around me are going to do, so I manipulate so that I can get peace. The world looks at all of these things and says, build it on something. They've got a whole list. Which, by the way, is the same list we're tempted to build it on. My reputation or my performance. I've done pretty well this week, so I can have peace this week. We'll see about next week. Or more stuff. You've got more things so you can have peace. But that's not the way Jesus' peace works. It's not built on carefully arranging your circumstances, which is good because you know when you try to carefully arrange your circumstances, things don't usually work out the way you wanted them to. But it's built on the circumstances of the cross. The peace Jesus gives is built on the fact that He lived a perfect life, and he died in our place, and he was raised, and he lives within us. Not because we deserve it or earn it in any way, but because of God's undeserved goodness that he works within me as we rely on him, as we have faith. That's why we can have peace. It's because of what Jesus did in those things, not any of the things that we would be tempted to build our peace on. If you build your peace, if you say, here's why I have peace, if that next sentence starts with, because I, that's not going to work well. It will fall apart. If that next sentence starts with, because Jesus, my peace I give to you. He continues, he says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He calls for a response. He says, you have the Spirit and you have my peace. Now, your heart is about to want to be troubled. That's part of the problem. When we're sitting on the edge of a battle, we go, I'm about to be troubled and I'm about to be afraid. We know that's what's coming. And Jesus says, don't let that reign in your heart, even though I'm leaving, because I've given you the Spirit and peace. I am leaving you these wonderful gifts. Let not your heart be troubled. And we might wonder, so what does, that, what does that look like? If I know I'm tempted to be afraid, Jesus tells me, don't let that happen. How do I do that? I don't know about you. I don't have a button that says, oh, fear's coming. Let's stop that. I don't have that button. But I think it would work something like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that is with me. So you say, this looks scary, but Jesus has given me his spirit and his peace. And so you work, you work within your own soul, like we did singing earlier. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You're talking to yourself. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Sing like never before. Worship his holy name. It's a battle. That's what we started out as saying we were in that battle. Jesus says, don't let fear reign in your hearts because you have the spirit and my peace. So what else does he tell them that they need going into darkness? He continues with a statement that it's a rebuke. It's a mild rebuke, maybe. We need rebukes sometimes. I do. He says in verse 28, You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. If you loved me, sounds weird. If you loved me, you'd be happy that I'm leaving. You'd rejoice. Say, Jesus, what are you you doing here? First, we have to see what he means when he says, for the Father is greater than I. Like earlier in the chapter when we looked at greater works, you have to ask the question, well, what does greater mean in this context? If I were to say, I used this example a few weeks ago, if I were to say that the king of England is greater than the owner of K-Brew coffee shop, you'd say, nobody thinks that the king of England is somehow more human than the owner of K-Brew. You'd say, there's something being compared here, power, influence, whatever, you can take your pick of what exactly is being compared. But there's something being compared here that is greater. So what is this? Well, first of all, Jesus had taken on 
humanity. He had taken on himself the form of a servant. When you saw him, you did not see the radiant God. You saw a person standing there. He looked like we look. Isaiah tells us there was nothing there that you'd be like, wow. He was just a teacher. So when you saw him, you didn't see the fullness of the glory of God. But right then, if you could have seen the Father, you would have seen the fullness of the glory of God. So in that sense, the Father is greater, one reason, because his currently displayed glory was greater. That'd be one reason. Second, there is, there is a relationship within the Trinity, and we stretch our minds to understand what Scripture teaches about this, of course. There is a relationship. The Father sends the Son, not the other way around. You'll never find a section in Scripture where the Son sends the Father. It doesn't work like that. The Father sends the Son. I always hesitate to use illustrations about the Trinity because they never work all the way. There's always something that doesn't quite work out. But Hebrews is close to using it this way, so I think it can be helpful to us. If I told you I'm going to step outside into the sun, all of you know I'm not going to step outside into a great big ball of gas. Like, what's the rays of the sun? Right, but we call it the sun, right? Or if I were to say the sun damaged the paint on my car, I don't mean that this gaseous ball came and hit it. I mean the UV rays that are part of what the sun is by its essence. It just comes out. That's what it is. We call that the sun. Now, Hebrews says Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. That's getting very close to the same thing. However, the author of Hebrews also says the next phrase, he's the exact imprint of the divine nature, which is where the whole sun illustration just completely breaks down. Right? But we can say within the Trinity, there is a sense in which, kind of like the sun is up there, but the rays are here, and they're both really, it's the sun. Jesus is God, fully God. He's fully man. He is the sit one as well. There's a sense in which you could look at that and say, well, the Father is greater, both in his expressed glory and in the fact that you have this relationship within the Trinity. And we could go more on that. But for sake of not losing this text, we're going to pause that line and come back. So what Jesus is saying, if you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father and the Father is greater than I. He says, there's something amazing about the Father and I'm going to rejoin the fellowship that I've had with him with my glory displayed. And if you really loved me, you would want that to happen. Going to the Father is good for Jesus because his work is going to be finished, his glory will be seen, and his fellowship will be restored. Like it was in eternity past. Jesus tells them, if I could paraphrase what he's saying, Jesus should say something like this, I know you want me to be here with you. Physically, that's what he means. But if you really love me, wouldn't you want my glory to be displayed like that? rather than just for you to have comfort in your particular situation? What about us? Would we rather have Jesus sitting in this room next to us to comfort us when we go through hard times? Or would we rather have Jesus exalted at the right hand of the Father, fully displaying his glory, having given us his spirit and his peace? And he tells the disciples... You're thinking about yourself in a certain way, and you're too interested in yourself and not in me. So really, he's telling them, you should want me to be exalted and finished with my work. And the spirit I give you is sufficient. And the peace I give you through the spirit and through my finished work as your advocate before the throne of God is sufficient. So he in a sense, rebukes their self-interest. They're like, I really want Jesus right here physically. And Jesus says, I'm going there, which is better for me and better for you. And that's the point. There's a beautiful truth in this passage. Jesus is not telling them, you're thinking too much about yourself in this hard time. Stop thinking about yourself and think about me. It's actually pretty close to that, but it's not quite that because what is really best for his disciples He's not telling them your self-interest 
is necessarily the problem. What he's telling them is, you're trying to define your self-interest yourself. Jesus says, look, the best thing for you is if I go to my Father and complete my work so that I can say, it is finished, paid in full, so that I can before the throne of God be an advocate for you, so that I can send the Spirit and give you my peace based on my finished work. Jesus says, your best, the best thing for you is that I go. If Jesus was not one with the Father, living a perfect life of peace, dying in their place, and rising as the exalted one in heaven, then they would not have the Spirit and his peace, which he just promised. Jesus says, I'm going to give you these things. It's interesting, too. We just went through a few weeks ago the story of Lazarus. And what all three groups of people that come to Jesus, when Jesus comes into town, they all say the same thing. If Jesus had been here, my brother or Lazarus would not have died. What Jesus is doing here is saying, it's better for you that I go to the Father because then guess what? It's not going to be me walking into town. It's my spirit everywhere accomplishing these works. Jesus tells them, your interest in yourself is too shallow. You want me to be right here to help you in your little situation. I want to make the world so much better, including you, through peace and the Spirit. You're trying to define, like, this is what will be good for me, God. Give me this. Give me Jesus physically here. Give me that. And Jesus says, God's got something way better than that. So he does rebuke their self-interest. If you loved me, you'd want me to go. But he does it in a way that says, and it's really the best thing for you that I go. So I want to ask you a few questions. Which I think you could have asked the disciples if you were sitting there. Do you love Jesus for who he is? Or do you love him for who you want him to be? Jesus says, if you loved me, you'd want me to finish my work this way. And it will be the absolute best thing for you. When you sit on the edge of a battle and you know it's coming, or when you don't know it's coming and all of a sudden the bullets are flying, do you love Jesus for who you want him to be or for who he is? Do you love him as God who became man and dwelt with us full of grace and truth? Or do you love him as a wise person? a good prophet, an example. Does Jesus show you the way to God by following him, or is Jesus himself the way to God? Those are two very different things. Do you love Jesus as a miracle worker who can give you comfort in this life, or as a dying lamb who will give you eternal life? I want to plead with you, if you haven't come to faith in Jesus, or if you have, and we all need to come back to this truth, the absolute best thing for you is not that Jesus will do whatever you want Jesus to do. It's that Jesus will do what he does. It's that Jesus is exalted and that he saves you. That is in your best interest. Scripture says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Jesus was going to save their souls by going through what he did. Do you love Jesus in a way that you define? If so, it's not really loving him. Or do you love him for the infinitely better promises that he gives? Jesus tells his disciples one more thing that they need to know. He tells them, I'm leaving the Spirit in peace. I give you amazing gifts. Then he tells them, don't be so self-centered and self-defining 
about your self-interest. Love me for who I am and what I am doing, not for what you want to command that I do. He gives them one other statement. He says, I am going to die, but not as a victim. It's easy when you see pictures and think about the crucifixion to look at Jesus as a victim. He wasn't. I mean, I realize in a sense you can say, well, he was a victim of injustice, sure. But Jesus came, he said, I've told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. He says, he has no claim, he has no right, he has no ability to win this battle. The only reason it looks like it is because I am going to lay down my life for my sheep. He has no claim on me. Satan's claim on people is is guilt. It's unforgiven sin. That's Satan's only claim. Notice I didn't say sin, although that would be true. I said unforgiven sin. That is Satan's only claim on people. And Jesus not only had no unforgiven sin, he had absolutely no sin. Which means that, just like Satan had no claim on Jesus because he had no sin, if Christ has forgiven your sins, he has no claim on you. And that's why we know he's raised and we will be raised. Because Satan has no claim on the people who come through the blood of Jesus. What do you need in your darkest hour? You need what Jesus said here. You don't need to just short-sightedly focus on your own struggles and your own battles that are coming. What you need is for Jesus to say through his word to you what he says to the disciples here. He says, I'm not physically right there with you, but I have given you the Holy Spirit as a helper and a teacher. You fight a battle to say... I need to be more loving. Jesus says, I have given you the spirit of love. I need his joy. And it's going to be hard in that situation that's coming to glorify him with joy. And Jesus says, I have given you the spirit that produces joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. The spirit of truth when you face lies and deceptions that you're not sure how to work through. The spirit of power when you're too weak to accomplish what you know you want. The spirit of obedience when you say, I'm so tempted to do the wrong thing. Jesus says, I have given you the Holy Spirit to glorify God as you battle in all of those things. And then I have given you my peace, the peace I own with God, others, and within yourself because of what I have accomplished as I go to my Father. Maybe you feel like your spiritual warfare is small. Kids, when you're faced with a temptation to do wrong this week and you're irritated, that's a spiritual battle. And the truth that God has given you here is what you need. His spirit is at work within you and he's given you his peace. If those gifts are not enough for you when you sit on the edge of the battle, then hear what he said to his disciples. Your love for Jesus is insufficient, and you're really not even loving yourself like you should. Because what Jesus gives you is better than anything you could dream up on your own. And when we go into battle, not only do we need to know what he leaves with us, not only do we need to know what's really good for us, but we need to know that the outcome of the battle is not in doubt. He has no claim on me. Jesus says, I'm going to go and it's going to look like Satan has won, but I don't die as a victim, but as a victor. When you face spiritual warfare, which you do this week, this afternoon, you might be readily aware of it and you might not, but when you face spiritual warfare, that's what we must cling to. He's given us his spirit to empower us. He's given us his peace to sustain us. He's given us what's truly good for us. And Jesus always wins. Praise God. He's worthy. I want to invite you to take a moment 
and just to respond to God to these truths in prayer, and then I will close us in prayer after. Father, we call on you for help. And we come knowing that we face a battle, we face enemies. We come as a church saying that what we long for more than anything else is that we would see you as worthy, that we would come in worship before your throne, that we would glorify you in everything that we do. And we know that Satan hates that goal. Strengthen us, empower us by your Spirit. Give us confidence in your peace that you have provided for us by your Son. May we do battle not from a place of fear and anxiety, but may we fight as one led by the Prince of Peace, given the Spirit of Peace. We thank you for the gift of peace with you that we can come despite what we have done this week in confidence, resting on Christ. And know that your attitude toward us is one of mercy and love. What that gift is absolutely priceless. I pray for anyone here who does not have your peace today, whether they feel it with, within themselves towards you or others, I pray for anyone who does not have that peace. Lord, will you draw their hearts to you? Will you work by the power of your Spirit to help them to see the reality of the truth you've told us in your Word? Give them such a hunger and thirst for the hope that you give that they would, wouldn't go anywhere else. And we do thank you that you work powerfully through your Word, that you guide your people. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.